Hello, my name is Hamish Renton, I'm Managing Director of HRA Global and I'm joined today by Kim Shaddock, I'm Senior Consultant at HRA Global. And we're going to talk about co-manufacturing, we're looking at the reasons why co-manufacturing is growing, some of the pitfalls, some of the advantages and where it might go next. So, what is driving the popularity of co-packing at the moment? Good question. I mean, food brands are used to confronting this issue of, shall I make it in-house or shall I outsource it? Uh, and they've been used to that for a long time. It's an age-old decision. But I think the rise of agile innovation and the outsourcing of MPD and research and development has meant that these value chains are being questioned more. And I think driven by shoppers, retailers for their parts, are looking to bring products to market quicker and they're looking for suppliers to, to rise to that challenge. And one of the ways that the bigger suppliers can do that is through outsourcing parts of the value chain. And I think in addition, there's a raft of brands who only co-pack, so they focus on the marketing, the sales, the IP, the product development, and they just look for someone to make the product. And we all know who they are, some very successful brands. And in addition, there's other manufacturers who might want a toe in the water. They might want to dabble in a category without doing the full nine yards of building a manufacturing plant. So I think co-packing is, is attractive to retailers, to those dabbling uh, big FMCG players, and also to, you know, if you like, shoppers, because ultimately they get products quicker. And I think sitting all over this is the issue of Brexit as well, where brands are looking at the cost of exporting to the UK and thinking, crikey, have I got a permanently disadvantageous exchange rate? Have I got tariffs? Have I got friction at the border? What have I got? So wrapping all that up, it means that outsourcing is high on many, many CEOs' to-do lists right now. So Kim, we've looked at you know what's the broad proposition of outsourcing and why it's you know co manufacturing being used by shoppers, by brands, by manufacturers and also demanded by retailers. What's the benefits of it as you would see it? So contract manufacturing is essentially the process of enlisting an external manufacturer to produce products on behalf of retailers and brands. Um, so one of the main benefits for brands is that it allows them to remain agile while still benefiting from the economies of scale associated with going with the larger manufacturer. Also, it's a real benefit for international businesses who are looking to enter new markets. Um, so it allows them to test out the market without making significant, potential, potentially risky decisions. So there have to be some downsides to contract manufacturing. What do you see as the drawbacks? Well, you have to outsource production and for a manufacturer that's a really scary thing to do because it is effectively your core competence uh, and therefore trust is a huge currency in, in these sorts of transactions you have to trust the third party that's probably the biggest one and brands you know going from that need to protect their quality standards they need to find a manufacturer who's the same standard of quality and also at a pragmatic level you know if it's a bottle or a can or a tray it needs to look identical from their own side to the third party side. So achieving that uniformity of product is pretty key as well. So the consumer doesn't have any sort of taste difference or any difference in the format or the serving size or the packaging or the substrates of it. And then lastly, if there's a mismatch, and this is where the wheels normally fall off, it could be commercial expectations on one side, a feeling that one side is sharing more of the risk than, than the other. Or even the chemistry within the team, you know, where maybe trust is in, in, in short supply, or perhaps there's some big characters on one side uh, or on the other. Uh, or perhaps there's capability expectations. So, you know, it may be, you know, they thought the manufacturer could produce this sort of a product or have this sort of a capacity, and actually it turns out that they don't. They're the big, big problems, and, and they're where the issues can really come down the line. So, tell me two of the key things that you need to look for when selecting the right contract manufacturing partner. Well, the first thing to look for is, is any conflict of interest. 
So you should be free in these sorts of arrangements to have a spectrum of deals, if you like, all the way through from exclusivity, where the manufacturer will not produce in that entire category for anyone other than this party, and all the way through to a kind of more kind of, if, if you like, tactical uh, bunch of production with, with lower minimum order quantities. There has to be no conflict of interest, or if there is, it needs to be, it needs to be out in the open and everybody needs to see it and, and agree to it. That's the main one. If you can pass that hurdle, then all things are possible. And secondly, the more prosaic point is the manufacturing capability needs to be understood. You need to understand the process kit, the filling kit, and the minimum order quantities. Because you may be looking for highly automated, low cost of goods production, really low unit costs. Or you may, you know, may be looking for a more flexible batch style production, which gives you the agility to do limited editions and one-offs. They need to be understood as well. And don't go fishing for low unit cost when what you're after is flexible production, because the two things will work against each other. So Kim, from your side then, what are the two things that you should look for in a manufacturing partner? So firstly, you need to make sure you're on the same page and that you have a good understanding of their future ambitions. So if you're looking to grow your volumes rapidly, you need to make sure that they a, have the land and the capex, as well as the willingness to expand with you. Um, you need to really have a straight conversation about any upfront investment involved. Um, and secondly, um, you need to know who to approach. So in a relatively niche growing market, there simply may not be the capacity available. Um, so then you're in the business of creating the capacity. And when you get into that kind of conversation, there could be a potentially endless list of manufacturers to contact. And then it's all about knowing the right people to contact. Just picking up on that, Kim, I think that point about creating capacity because it's an early stage industry or it's a niche market is really key. And that's where I think HRA, you know, as well as other areas can help because creating that capacity, you, you need someone with the vision and the, the appetite to invest. You need someone with the, the cash or the backers to invest, but also the manufacturing know-how because you are actually pushing the industry forward. You're making products that have not been made and finding that person is a real art form. Uh, and I always liken it to finding a, a ruby in the dust. There's a lot of sifting and networking that needs to be done, usually to find the person that knows the person that, that is, is a contender for this. And that's why our black book and our network's really useful. And I think more broadly than that, co-manufacturing's huge decisions take good advice. Uh, and you want to trust somebody that's been around this a few times. So I'm pretty confident because we've helped over 100 clients in more than 25 countries and I think in contract manufacturing projects, it was crikey, we must have done more than 20 projects in that patch now. Yeah, I mean from cereal to yoghurt to ice cream we've accumulated a vast database of potential manufacturers so we're pretty confident we can find the right manufacturer for anyone. Yeah, and I think essentially clients come to us to simplify this process or to get an objective view on what they're doing to make sure their commercial arrangement is the right one. And I think in terms of finding the right way forward, whether it's to outsource research and development, manufacturing, or indeed new product development, I think, we, you know, hand on heart, we can get people a result. So Kim, if people are looking at these sorts of projects, contemplating their options, what should they do? So you can find our contact details on the website, just drop us a line or give us a call. We look forward to hearing from you.